father worked on the railways. My mother came from a poor farming family. I was their only child. We had a typical flat in working class Hamburg. Factories were all around us, smoke and noise. The banging and grinding filled the air throughout the day. But it was music to our ears, the music of life itself. This is the story of one man's childhood. Ten years old when the Nazis came to power, like so many children in Germany, Henry Mettelmann learned to live, to fight, if necessary to die, for Adolf Hitler. When my opponents say, we won't join you, I just say, your children are mine already. What are you? In time you will die. Your sons and daughters stand forever in my new camp, and in a short time they'll know nothing else but this new community. For Henry's parents, the Nazi takeover spelled disaster. Henry remembers their hopelessness as the Brown Pest, as his father called them, marched in triumph outside. But for Henry, the Nazis were new. Exciting. When my father spoke so badly about them, I just didn't understand it. I thought, what does he mean that these Nazis are so dangerous? They were always so friendly to me. I used to run alongside them as they marched, singing their songs with them. They were always so smart in their uniforms, the leather, the jackboots. As our march yet, mit ruhig festem Schritt. To get the next generation on their side, the Nazis had put tremendous energy into winning them over. Theirs was the party of youth against age, offering young people not just a dream, but a role to play. Standard bearers in the march to a new dawn. It was a way of channeling the natural rebelliousness of youth on organized lines. And the organization responsible was the Hitler Jugend, the youth wing of the Nazi party. Denn ihr seid Fleisch von unserem Fleisch und Blut, von unserem Blut. Und in euren jungen Gehirn brennt dasselbe Geist, der uns beherrscht. In 1932, the Hitler Youth numbered just 100,000. Within two years, it numbered three and a half million. And by 1939, it was an army, compulsory for all boys, with girls joining its sister organization, the League of German Maidens. It was the largest youth movement the world had ever seen. For us, liegt Deutschland. In us, marschiert Deutschland. Und hinter uns kommt Deutschland. Henry's first contact with the Hitler Youth came in the summer of 33. Like many of his friends, he joined a youth club, the Church Scouts. They met at the parish hall for songs and competitions. But one day, they turned up to find Hitler Youth boys there to teach them drill. Henry was secretly delighted, but telling his father wasn't easy. He hadn't wanted me and the Scouts in the first place, a Christian youth organization. He was a down-to-earth working man and didn't want his only son brainwashed by anyone. But to see me sucked up into the Hitler youth, that really hurt him. And when I told him... You must buy me a uniform. They told me to tell you. A brown shirt before the next meeting. <laughs> he just laughed. He said... Know how a bull hates a red rag when it's waved in front of it? Well, that's what a brown rag does to me. I will never waste good money on a brown shirt for my boy. So what do I tell them? Tell them! Tell them on my pay. 
I spend my money on a brown shirt, then we don't eat. They'll just have to accept that. And they did accept it, grudgingly. But at the next Hitler Youth meeting, they made me step forward. And I was given a parcel, which I was not to open, but to take home and hand to my parents. Fritz, look. Two brown shirts for the boy, with the compliments of the party. Good. Good? What's good? Because a shirt is a shirt. So what if it's brown? It's material I won't have to buy and sew. It's good quality, too. He can put his elbows on the table, and it won't wear through. I simply loved it in the Hitler Youth. The uniform was so smashing. The dark brown, the black, the swastika. I loved marching, the flag before us, a drum beating the pace. Most roads in Germany at that time had cobbles. It was painful on our feet, but that didn't matter. We felt important. The police had to stop traffic to give us right of way, and passers-by had to salute to respect our flag. I remember how funny it sometimes was with the old ladies with their shopping bags shooting their arms into the air. As with many German children, the Hitler Youth became the single most important influence in Henry's life. His group met after school and all day Saturday. Plenty of sport, with the emphasis on teamwork. And training in useful skills. Signaling, fixing bikes, collecting waste and scrap metal, but the most important lesson was in Nazi theory. Learning to love Hitler. It was as if we had created our own atmosphere, the atmosphere of the young, the coming German generation. After all, as the Führer had written, Germany's future belonged to its youth. I told father that. He replied somewhat crushingly. That's like saying the grass is green. As his father knew, Henry was being indoctrinated, his head filled with propaganda, Nazi lies, or half-truths endlessly repeated. For adults, spotting propaganda was hard enough. For the young, it was almost impossible. I remember one day I came home from school and said to my mother, you know, Mama, I don't think it's right that Dr. Bergman touches me anymore. Dr. Bergman was our family doctor. Of course, straight away, my mother jumped to the wrong conclusion. What did he do? Oh, no. He treated me well. He's a very kind man. Well, what then? It's just... I don't think it's right. The German boy should be touched by a Jew. She was horrified that I should say such a stupid, wicked thing. In my defense, I explained how that very day a man in a brown uniform had told our class in school how we should keep the race pure and how he'd been very proud of me because I had said, I know, why don't we throw all the Jews out of Germany? Like this was some brilliant solution to Germany's problems. But my mother wasn't impressed. All she wanted to know was... Dr. Bergman, did you mention Dr. Bergman to this man that he touched you? Yes, Mama. But I did say I didn't think Dr. Bergman was a bad man. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's all she said. This story so typical in Nazi Germany, shows how easily young minds took on board dangerous ideas. Schools have been Nazified, anti-Nazi teachers sacked, textbooks rewritten. Nazi race science was taught in the classroom. Jewish students had separate desks, then separate schools. By 42, they could get no formal education at all. 
Meanwhile, children like Henry were being taught how to spot the Jewish enemy. They told me that because of the German blood in my veins, I was a superior human being. I never dreamt of asking what German blood really was. Old history textbooks were destroyed. Those that replaced them taught children the Nazi version of Germany's past and future. We learned about Lebensraum, living space, how glorious it would be to fight Poland and Russia, to conquer land for Germany. We learned about battles and wars and kings, how if we stuck together and weren't stabbed in the back like last time, we could not lose. Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. Germany above everything. And I lapped it all up. It just upset me that my father was so scornful. Balderdash. But what was I to do? Was I to say to my teachers, it's all balderdash? I shouldn't believe what they teach me at school. Is that what you're saying? Not to believe my teachers? All right, young man. Some of the things they teach you, believe. This pencil, when I drop it, the Nazis cannot change gravity, but just use your head. If it sounds like opinion, say to yourself, whose opinion is it? Two plus two equals four. That's fine. That's all right. But even two plus two could brainwash. Maths books taught angles by plotting the paths of falling bombs. Adding sums meant working out the money saved if Germany got rid of its invalids. For me, it was all very confusing. Everything I heard at home was the opposite of what they taught me at school and in the Hitler Youth. And it bothered me a great deal. I wanted my loved ones to be right, but I also loved Germany, my fatherland. And I firmly believed that our Führer was giving us back our dignity. I used to get so angry. All right, I'll tell them tomorrow. They're just teaching us lies. No, Henry. Promise me, younger, you will never repeat what we say to you outside these four walls. Do you promise? Of course, I kept my promise, but I'll never forget their terror, the power I had just as a child. If I had let slip all my father told me, who knows, late at night, the knock on the door, arrest by the Gestapo. We were encouraged in our Hitler Youth meetings to tell tales if we ever heard grown-ups talk against Hitler, against the regime. And there were children so passionately Nazi, they turned in their own parents. How can you explain that? Only that Hitler grabbed us so young, and he never let go. How many children escaped indoctrination? It's impossible to know. As 10 years of Nazi rule passed by, the Hitler Youth lost its appeal as something exciting. It was now compulsory, backed up by Gestapo laws and busybody Hitler Youth patrols. More and more, the rebellious thing was to refuse to join. These photographs are the only surviving pictures of German youth gangs in the early 1940s. The Edelweiss Pirates, the Texas Band, the Navajos. They beat up Nazi officials, wrote graffiti on walls. But mostly, they just hung out and listened to American jazz. Their casual, fun-loving attitude made a mockery of Nazi control. Outrageously, they call it swing. Sometimes two boys with one girl. Sometimes all together in a wild circle. Girls wear lipstick and paint their nails. It's monstrous. I remember one time when a group of jazzers had gathered on the pier to play Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, not disturbing anyone. 
but Jass was un-German. And so the self-important Hitler Youth leader marches up and orders them to stop this Jewish nonsense. But the Jassers stripped his clothes off, stuffed the most disgusting things into his mouth, I will not say what, and they chucked him in the river by this huge outflow. The whole thing took no more than a few minutes. The government hit back. Curfews were ordered to stop young people visiting bars after nine o'clock. Hanging round and smoking in public were banned. Forced labor for those that broke the rules or death. This photo shows the fate of 12 young Edelweiss pirates caught in Cologne in 44. The ideal child raised by proud Nazi parents was of quite another mold. For one thing, young men and young women had different parts to play. As a leader of the Girls League put it. Men and women, boys and girls, must carry out their duty according to their station. Boys we raise as political soldiers, and girls as the comrades of these political soldiers. We teach them to be wives and mothers, and to breed the next generation. That's all. Kinder, Kercher, Kucher. Children, church and kitchen. Girls in Nazi Germany weren't encouraged to have ambitions beyond the home. In the Girls' League, they learned cooking, making beds, childcare. Their clothes and hair copied old peasant styles. No cigarettes, no makeup. A perm could be punished by shaving the head. Boys, meanwhile, were being bred for war. These scenes record life on a typical Hitler Youth summer camp. The camps were the high point of the Hitler Youth calendar and they were much loved. They gave poor children the chance of a holiday, sometimes for the first time. They mixed rich and poor together. They introduced city kids to the countryside. But their main function was basic military training. We learned how to throw hand grenades, how to dig trenches. Then they take us on long, hard marches to toughen us up. If anyone fell, they'd shout till they wobbled onto their feet again. They would divide us into two groups, the blues and the reds. One group to defend a position, the other to attack it. The whistle, and then contact. Noise, bloody noses, twisted arms, shrieks of pain. In the beginning, I hated it all, but I got used to it. And I think what it did was it developed the aggression we would all need to help Germany fight a war. Some historians argue Hitler wanted war from the start. The way he delighted Germans by snubbing the Treaty of Versailles, rearming and reclaiming peacefully land lost to Germany in 1919. The Saar, the Rhineland, Austria in 1938, and the Sudetenland in Western Czechoslovakia. But then, in March 1939, the rest of Czechoslovakia fell. Once again, the rattle of a German army on the march echoes in Europe. Where that march may end, no man can foretell. Least of all, the man who gave the order. Czechoslovakia wasn't conquered to unify German-speaking people. This was invasion, pure and simple. The first of many invasions to create Lebensraum, living space, for Hitler's master race. And suddenly the purpose of all that youth indoctrination was clear. In just six years, Hitler had turned boys like Henry into soldiers strong enough and committed enough to wage a war of aggression.
My father felt that the only cause worth fighting for was peace. He had fought in the First World War. To him, it had been a senseless slaughter of millions of young men. And he felt it almost a holy duty to save me from experiencing such horror. But no, I didn't see it like that at all. And if I was to die on a battlefield, well, that would be glorious, protecting my mother and father from our enemies. Such a death would be tremendous. September 1939, Poland. German aggression kickstarts the Second World War. When it finally came, it was almost a relief. The air clearing after so much uncertainty. Our future was now in the open. Hitler himself said as much. And we believed our Führer with all our hearts and we were prepared to follow him to the end of the world. Henry Metalman himself was drafted in 1941. Few in his company of 200 men were over 20 years old, and all were ex-Hitler youth. They saw their journey east as a great adventure. But the reality of war on the Russian front was somewhat different. This was perhaps the most brutal battle zone of the Second World War. Nine out of every ten German casualties fell here. My father died just before we left. On his deathbed, he told me, remember, the enemy soldiers you'll be fighting will be just working men like you. Force-fed the same slogans, fooled into the same false dreams. I just humored him. Later, I came to realize the truth of his words. <laughs> <laughs> 